and the one thing keeping you from lunch is going to be Recovering Short Generators of Principal Ideals and Psychotonic Rings. It's by Ronald Kramer, Leo Dukar, Chris Pikert, and Oda Dragev, and uh, Leo is going to give the talk. All right, thank you, Nigel, for the introduction. Um, so from the title, you might not directly know what this talk is about. So here is uh, the topic. So principal ideals in cryptography. So those are related to those schemes that are connected with special lattices. So more precisely, we, we, we will work uh, in a number field and it's string of integer. So typically we consider uh, the cyclotomic ones because they're very nice geometric and computational properties. And so typically we do ring LWE or more involved problem uh, on those rings, but for efficiency or for functionality, some crypto system went a bit further and started basing scheme not on those um, uh, ring LWE problem or entry problems, but directly on principal ideals on those rings. So this is the case of the solid all key scheme that was uh, developed internally by JGCHQ. Um, some fully homomorphic encryption, so that was uh, uh, one of the first attempt at uh, um, improving upon the, the gentry scheme. Uh, and also more recently to get those graded uh, encoding schemes that are used to build uh, in this fishability obfuscation or, uh, or multi linear maps. Um, so they all share this key generation procedure somehow. You will choose, as your security, you're going to choose a short element G in this ring. And as you public key, you're going to describe um, this, uh, the, the ideal it generates, but you're going to describe it as a general lattice. You're, you're just going to give a bad Z basis of it. So we know it has some structure, but we don't necessarily know what, uh, what a generator of it is, uh, meaning a generator for the ring. So for example, you can take the Hermit normal form of any Z basis of that lattice. And you give this as your public key. So the cryptanalysis question, of course, is the following. Um, it's, um, so you, can, you, can you, given just uh, this, this bad basis, can you actually recover this short generator? And you split uh, this as two problems. Um, the first one is called the principal ideal problem. So you, you're given this Z basis and you have the promise that it is the basis of a principal ideal and you need to recover some generator H of this ideal, but not necessarily the one that is actually usable as a secret key. And the second part uh, of an attack on this would be, well, now you have one element H that actually generates uh, exactly this ideal I, and you need to recover the good one, the one that is usable as a secret key, or something that is also as short uh, as this uh, original G. Uh, so what should be the cost of those two steps according to the current state of the art? Well, there has been quite some study recently on those uh, on the question of this first problem, the principal ideal problem. And actually we have sub-exponential time classical algorithm for this task. And this task look uh, very similar to factorization problem, but you, you have to solve factorization problem in number field instead of doing this over the integer. So that's why you end up with uh, bigger um, sub-exponential exponent, two-thirds instead of one-third. Uh, maybe it can even be improved further. And also very recently, to ensure that you can actually solve this using quantum polynomial time algorithms, and that's a bit scary. But again, it's not uh, extremely surprising because they're related to factorization, and factorization we know how to do quantumly. Um, so it was recently shown that we can basically generalize all those techniques to many dimensions. So what I'm more interested in this talk is the second step that's not quantum. Um, and it's quite well known in algebraic number theories that you can view somehow this problem as a closed vector problem in a lattice that's called the log unit lattice of the ring. And, but that's the very general case of finding a, a short generator. Um, for the instances that I explain how to, to, to generate for, for crypto purposes, this closest vector problem, CVP, becomes um, a BDD problem, bounded distance decoding. So that's uh, how um, it was explained before. It's like a problem, it's a lattice problem with the promise that the solution is actually quite close to a lattice vector and that makes the problem slightly easier in general, but still typically hard. And in a recent draft from the GCSQ, they claimed that actually this should be easy 
when we take the uh, M cyclotomic ring for M a power of two, and uh, there was little explanation, but it was very uh, quickly confirmed by experiments, and the experiments are not very hard uh, to mount, uh, so it, it, it was a bit surprising, and uh, so that's what we try to clarify in this work. We focus on the second step, and we try to explain why, and we actually give a proof that it can indeed be solved in classical polynomial time for those specific instances. Uh, so when, ring, uh, when the ring R is uh, si uh, integer of uh, cyclotomic number field, but not only for powers of two, we can actually prove it for uh, powers of any prime under reasonable conjectures. Okay, um, an overview of uh, the a bit more details on the, on the, on the problem, on uh, what we have to do. So remember the, the problem, short generator recovery. So we're given one generator of our ideal H and we need to find a short one. We need to find a small one G that generates the same ideal and two elements in a ring that they will generate the same ideal well, exactly if they multiplicatively differ by a unit of the ring. So for example, in Z, that would be one and minus one, but in more general rings, you have plenty of units, you have infinitely many units. So the space you need to explore to find this short generator is somehow the group of units, and that's a multiplicative group. And we are asking a geometric question. So we're working in a group that's a billion, and we're asking a geometric question. It's a bit annoying that it's multiplicative, so we're gonna take the logarithm to make it an additive problem. So because an additive group with geometry on it, that's called a lattice. And then we can use lattice algorithms. So we take logarithms. How do we do that in general for a number field? Well, oops, sorry, this, this kind of stuff was done a long time ago by Dirichlet. You basically take the logarithm of the absolute value of each of the complex embeddings. I'm not gonna annoy you too long with this. Um, so basically there's a notion of logarithm to make it uh, an additive problem. And uh, there is a quite old theorem, Dirichlet unit theorem, that, take you, that tells you that if you take the logarithm of all these elements of this unit group, R star, well, actually what you get, lambda is an additive group, but it's not only an additive group, it's actually going to be a lattice in Rn, and we even know its rank. And this is how we reduce our problem to a closed vector problem, but in a fixed lattice, lambda here. The lattice lambda does not depend on the problem. It only depends on the ring you've chosen to build your scheme on. So the element G, is going to be a generator of H if only they differ multiplically by a unit. And if you take the logarithm of this, it means that the logarithm of G is uh, in the corset of lambda shifted by log of H. And it's not only an algebraic mapping, this logarithm mapping. It actually preserves some geometric information. And we can say in some way that G is going to be the smallest generator of all the generator of that ideal, if and only if log of G is actually the smallest element in this corset. In other terms, if log of G is the closest element to log of H in lambda. Um, this was a bit algebraic, so let's do some pictures to, 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 to get a bit familiar with those notions. So here is my ring represented in its, uh, here's the real embeddings, it only has real embeddings. I'm taking a very simple ring, two dimension, Z uh, adjoint with square root of two, and all, here are all my elements. So when I add up two elements, I just add everything coefficient-wise, so you're familiar with this, this is a lattice, but it's also a ring, and here when I do these embeddings, the multiplication also happened component-wise. So if I take two points, this point and this point, and multiply the x coordinate and the y coordinate, I will still get a point uh, in that lattice. And now, the geometry we're studying here is not, is the multiplicative geometry, so that's why I'm trying to represent here. Um, and in this geometry, we have uh, element that I would call orthogonal. So what are the orthogonal elements? Well, those are elements when I multiply by those elements, what happened to my space is it, it only gets um, uh, scaled in every direction the same way and potentially rotate. So for example, if I multiply by two, and I just, uh, I just uh, shift, uh, I just scale everything. Minus two, it's also the case, but if you also do this with root two, 
well, then you've got some rotation, but there are still orthogonals. And the units, the importance in the units um, here, well, units are kind of the uh, opposite concept or orthogonal concept. Units are elements that don't scale volumes, but they shift things in one direction. So if they scale things horizontally by some factor, they will scratch the rest by the same factor. And so quite easily in two dimension, you see that this form of hyperbola. Um, and then you have those isonorm curves. So those are elements that potentially only differ multiplicatively by your units, but that might not be perfectly the case as we will see. So now what happens if we take the logarithm of this picture? Well, we get this, um, this logarithm embedding on the right here. Okay. Um, so those orthogonal elements that will be sent here and the units, they'll be completely orthogonal to this. And well, originally our stuff here, this, uh, when we do multiplication in this string, we obtain a monoid. So when we take the log, we still get a monoid. So we can add stuff, but we cannot necessarily subtract them because we were not necessarily uh, allowed to divide them on this side. Um, so now what's interesting is that if you intersect uh, those points with the ones that are just units, well, then you're supposed to get a group. That's the definition of being a unit. And on this picture, it means that this subset of the blue point intersected with the red line, well, what you're going to get is actually a lattice. And interesting properties also from the mon monoid property, what you can see is that um, now if you intersect every line with this, uh, every isonorm line with the, the blue dots, you get each time finitely many copies of your original log unit lattice, uh, this line here. So sometimes you don't have anything on the line, but you always get a uh, finitely many sheeted copy of that original lattice. Um, and what we want to do when we want to recover a short unit, well, when we want to recover a short unit, we are only allowed to multiply by units. So somehow we won't get really closer to zero. Um, so we don't think, we, don't, we cannot make things short in that sense, but we can make them short by making them closer to orthogonal. So things are short if somehow they don't distort space too much. And we want to bring our elements back closest possible to this line. And we translate it to this logarithm, uh, through the logarithm. What we want to do is like we want to bring things back to this uh, beam of light. So we have a fundamental domain uh, when we're quotient by the group of units, and it looks like, um, like this bend in the, in the logarithmic unit and like a cone in this space. Um, so if we can bring things back to this fundamental domain, then we've brought them back closer to, to, to being small or orthogonal, and that's good. But we need to be careful on which fundamental domain we choose, because if we choose a, another fundamental domain like this one, then we get things that are much further, auto, uh, much further away from orthogonal. And of course, we need to be able to do this algorithmically. So we need a fundamental domain for which there is an efficient uh, reduction algorithm. And for this, we can actually go for the simplest algorithm uh, there is in lattice theory to reduce the fundamental domain. We will use the simple rounding algorithm. So let's not go over the detail too much, but uh, what's important is that when you want to use it as a decoding algorithm, you can characterize its correctness depending on the dual basis. So if you have some lattice point that has some error and you want to recover the lattice point, well, the property that you need is that the error um, has a small scalar product with every dual vector here. And this characterization is going to allow us to get uh, our proof go through. Uh, all right, so that's the general strategy to uh, tackle this problem. So that's a kind of a folklore strategy for uh, algebraic number theorists. Uh, the first step is to first construct a basis B of this log unit lattice, and only getting a basis of it is not an easy problem. It's not easy to know exactly what this lattice is, but for s those particular um, rings, especially the rings of integer cyclotomic number fields, we actually know a lot of units. And we conjecture that in most of the case, they're actually bases that we catch all elements with those. Um, and, and, and we have a very simple explicit formula uh, for, for those units given here. So the second step um, is to prove that this basis is actually of sufficient quality 
to solve this problem. And the third step is to prove that what you want to correct, the error you want to correct, this log of G, is going to be small enough. And those two steps are the technical contribution of our paper. So the first step is an estimation of the norm of those dual vectors, and amusingly, it uh, relates to uh, analytical number theory. I will very briefly give an overview of this, and uh, we also solve these third points, like we uh, study the distribution of log of G when G is Gaussian, and this is done using sub-exponential random variable theory. I'm not going to I'm not going to cover this during this talk. All right, so uh, what, uh, what are the, uh, the technical results? So the first, uh, as I told you, we use analytical number theory to characterize the quality of this basis. And this is based on this kind of, uh, of theorems. Um, this one is from Lando, but we're using other ones. That if chi is a non-quadratic Dirichlet character, uh, we have this bond. So what do these things relate to? Well, those uh, are objects that were introduced uh, by Dirichlet and Riemann for uh, the program of studying prime numbers. So that's the uh, interesting part of this result, is that this problem actually relates to questions from analytical number theory. And uh, using uh, this kind of result and uh, some a bit more effort, what we can prove is a bond, an upper bond, on the length of those dual vectors. So we solve a geometric question using analytical number theory. Um, and so how should you interpret this, uh, this result? Well, this log unit lattice, so log of uh, our, uh, our star, actually admits a known and an efficiently computable basis that is almost orthogonal. And because it's almost orthogonal, BDD is going to be an easy problem. Um, so when we apply this to cryptanalysis, the corollary of this uh, theorem is that, well, we formalize what was claimed before, is that if G follows a reasonable distribution, like the Gaussian one, then when we're given any generator H of an ideal G, we can actually recover G in polynomial time uh, with a given probability. And if we combine this with the poly time quantum attack for the first step, the PIP step, well, we can break several cryptographic proposals, or we can also apply sub-exponential algorithm if, uh, meaning that even classically, we'd have to increase the parameters to be secure. Um, what else do we do in this paper? We also slightly study uh, worst cases, because so far I've been speaking about those uh, instances that come from uh, cryptographic instances. But now that we have some information about the basis of this lattice, can we say some stuff about the worst case? And what we show is that in the worst case, uh, for any generator H uh, of a principal ideal, well, given by this H, you can actually find another generator of H and his length can be bounded by uh, the algebraic norm uh, rescaled by the dimension, multiplied by, um, by a sub-exponential factor. So here this factor is basically taking account for how big your ideal is. So here we have, you have the approximation factor and for such an approximation factor, um, if you use classical algorithm like LLN and BKZ, you were supposed to require super polynomial time, even... No, just cyclotomic. Um, and uh, actually, this result is nearly optimal in the sense that there exist some ideals where the shortest generator can not be any... Uh, it must be at least as large as this. So. Why I'm using M and N here, yeah, whatever. N equal M or kind of N. Um, uh, N is equal to phi of N, sorry. So basically this result is, is nearly optimal. And uh, this has a bit uh, cons some consequences on uh, the open question. So uh, my first open question would be, are there other classes of ring for which we can uh, carry on this kind of study of the log unit lattice? So what happens is that for the cyclotomic, there are plenty of, I, I say several, but there are actually plenty of happy events that allows the analysis to go through. Um, so for othering, it might be harder to study, but the question is like, is, does it mean that those problems are harder uh, intrinsically or they're just harder to study? So uh, by switching to another ring, are we actually just uh, improving security by ignorance or actually improving uh, security uh, concretely, uh, sorry, intrinsically. 
so the second question is, of course, can we generalize this result uh, to non-principal ideals? Because so far we've uh, been dealing with principal ideals, and all those string LWD problems, they're more connected to general ideals, so non-principal ideals, and in the worst case. So can you say uh, anything about non-principal ideals? And my guess is that might not be completely impossible, but uh, you start doing some, uh, you, need, you need to start using some fancy uh, number theory. So you have to study like kind of, to put some geometry on the class group to do that. And you have uh, many theorems that are interesting in that regard. Uh, but if you do so, we would still have kind of this limit that was given by, by uh, the last slide, that in the worst case, you can only get this kind of approximation factor. And so what, uh, what you can, does it also have a bearing on the actual concrete security of Ringa Libri? Because this problem reduces to this one, but it's not because we break this one that we break this one. Um, and this to me seems much harder than, the, than this step. Uh, and even if it, well, because suddenly you start introducing non-commutativity and uh, then you need very, very serious uh, um, yeah, non-commutative geometry in there. And in this case, we don't know how to go with many dimensions. We know how to do things in very little number of dimensions. Um, but even if we would be carried through, if uh, without any additional technique, if it was still based on the same type, same type of techniques, we would still be limited by this, uh, to this approximation factor, uh, which is inherent to any approach uh, using the log unit lattice. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any question. Are there any questions? No, I've got, I've got a question. So, if you so these are only works for cyclotomics, which for which it's easy because we know the cyclotomic units. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we've got a very good control of the regulator. So, would you be able to say generalize your result for rings for which we we know something nice about the regulator? So, if you know something about the regulator, you might be able to prove uh, non-uniform results. Like, oh, they exist a basis that would make this problem easy, and because uh, the the ring, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, then then with a non-uniform attack, you might be able to say some stuff. Um, I'm, I'm I cannot uh, promise that it will all depend on uh, how big your regulator is somehow. Okay, okay, cool. And then and then for the non Principal ideals. So, what would you do? Would you just say that you have a two-element representation and a non-principal ideal, which is itself small? So, what does that mean geometrically? So, what you want to do is to f so you what I would try to do, and I'm trying to do, but uh, is to try to find uh, an ideal that is a multiple. A you're trying to find a principal ideal, which is a multiple of your current ideal. So you're trying to, to walk in the class group using small elements to walk back to the, to, the, to the trivial class. And you're trying to find a short path in there. Okay, but what happens if your, your ideal started with non-principal? Yeah, that's the point. Okay. You, you, you start from, from uh, the non-principal one. You start from the non-principal one and you walk by multiplying by small, uh, small ideals. You try to walk your way back to the principal, to the trivial class, to the Okay, so that's like um, a Galbraith thing with the. Pardon? That's like Galbraith thing with walking through the class group because the endomorphism ring and the metric curve, right? Yes, that's yeah. very related. I've been trying to apply this, but the theorems are not powerful enough for what I want. Okay, okay. Cool. Is there any other questions? No? Okay, let's thank the speaker again. In fact, let's thank both speakers again. <laughs> it's now time for lunch. Make sure you return in the afternoon at the correct time to